the beauty of watercolors is that it's it's transparent. Um, the light goes through your paint, reflects off the surface of the paper, and gives this gorgeous translucent glow, unlike any other medium. I don't care what they say. You know, those oil painters. So again, I'm blending this up. Helps me get a little bit more value. Um, I'm going to move on up here. Uh, one thing you need to know and remember very well is that you can't do two areas that are next to each other that are damp. If you do, then you end up with one big area instead of two little areas. So again, here we're upside down. I want to come into these passages. You want to treat every little section as its own painting. Um, that also keeps you from worrying about things. We don't need to worry about stuff. So I'm putting in some color right here next to this. Put the brush down. And again, start out here, put down a little bit of moisture, come up, just catch that edge. And let it do its own thing. Um, most of what happens, happens after you put your brush down. And, and that's a good thing, and that's why it's, it's such a rewarding experience. Sometimes frustrating, but often very rewarding, and it, uh, it's surprising to see what happens. But if you don't let it, you know, we, we rush to repair and we rush to fix things. Try not to keep a paper towel wadded up in your hand. If you do that, your tendency is when you make a mistake to go bam, 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 bam. And then you've pushed the paint into the paper and you've made a big mess that won't come up and you can't repair. So if you apply it gently, it comes off easily things to think about. Um, again here, anytime I'm going to paint a new subject I'll try to study it if possible. And in these it's a, it's a case of the darkest areas where it first comes out of the, the rosebud. They're wrapped tightly so the darkest color is here. It's very dense, very thick at that point. And then as it comes up and into the light it becomes lighter. Um, Really studying light and how it affects objects and, and how we perceive objects is, is also important. And the first reason you paint is to have fun. So if you're not doing that, go take a class, take a workshop. It's, it is more fun when you're with other people and you get that, that feedback from other students. Often they ask questions that you forgot to. So I'm doing little bitty triangles, dark at the bottom and lighter as they come up. So you do every other one, and then when they start to dry, you come back and fill in those gaps. Um, things I can do in the meantime. This petal comes up and folds out. The light hits it, and it reads as kind of flat, and that's not really what I want to do. So we want that to appear to curve back. You put a little blob right here, and then it's called shade and fade. Water. You want to catch this and then just pull it out to the end gradually. Catch this side, pull it out to the end. That side's curving in a little bit. Let's work on the other one. You don't want to outline the whole thing, because in the end you'll end up with a solid red flat puddle. So the way we contour things in watercolors is just that. Color, value, shading. I could use a little more. The biggest tendency um, is to overwork things. You want to make everything work immediately, and that's not the way it is in watercolors as a rule. Uh, it's, it's more of a layering process. It's starting out in kindergarten, working your way all the way through school. Usually by the time they're in junior high, they're awful. Most paintings I do, I get halfway through and ask myself why in the world I started this because it's never going to turn into anything. <laughs> you have to keep going. You get past that stage, you get them back into high school, they start to become normal again, and then when they grow up, they might even turn out pretty well. So you have to give them that chance. Don't give up on them too soon. So a lot of people do that. They get frustrated and they just say, okay, this is not going to turn out and put it away. 
you have to keep going. So just remember that. Um, again, I'm coming back in here. If you have a pause button on your VCR or DVD player or, or however you're watching this, um, I would have stopped at the end of these two um, steps and try that. Um, I think that teaching a step-by-step -step method is, is very important and I paint right along with everybody. And I can't tell you how many of these I've painted. Um, there are hundreds of these floating around and everybody's mother and great aunt gets them for Christmas. Um, and they always love them. They think you're a genius because you painted that. You know you're actually doing okay when somebody says, you painted that? And you can say yes. The good thing about being an artist, even if it doesn't turn out like it's supposed to, and even if it doesn't look like it's supposed to, all you have to say is, I'm an artist, I meant to do that. They fall for it. You use your artistic license. Got mine in Florence. So it's a little bit of tweaking at this point. Um, these things need to dry just a little bit. If you look at areas like this, they're slightly disjointed. And sometimes all it takes is one stroke to pull all of that together. So I'm going to take, again, some alizarin crimson, still using the same color, and run a line that connects all of those. Now I'll come back. If what was under this was dry, this would be a, a really good step. It may not work too well, but that's okay. I'm going to come back and then just soften the outside edge. What that does, all of a sudden, all of these are connected. They're all underneath this pedal. And now it starts to make more sense. It's coming up and curving. Along the same line, I can come back on this side, put a little line of color here, soften that. Just soften this one edge and pull that down a little bit. And now this is almost three-dimensional. Uh, we can do one more step. It's called dry brushing. And I look at this and I see a little bit of texture here. Same thing here. So I'm just going to put a couple little spots that don't look too good, <laughs> too well. And then I'm going to soften those. And it looks a lot more natural. Um, the important thing to, to know when you're painting nature, if it's too perfect, it doesn't look like nature. Very few straight lines. If there are straight lines, then it looks man-made. This is almost too much of a line, so I'm going to come back and add a little bit of color. There's also a little sliver of light in, the, in there. I do this a lot. have too much water. The best way to solve that is to dry your brush off, lay it on there, and just pick up the excess water. And then you're free to continue. I don't know if you've noticed or not, a little sliver here, it's a cut in that petal. And then a white stripe right there, and that's where the light cuts through that cut and it creates that shape. So if this were not so wet, I could go ahead and show you. But we put the cut in there just by putting a little bit of dark. Let's see. And then this side will lift out. And sometimes it's those little things that really make them sing. And if this is too detailed for you, it's okay. You don't have to paint this way. But it's a great start. <laughs>